Edwin Walker was a decorated army general who was known for his service in World War II and Korea. President Kennedy relieved General Walker of his command in West Germany in 1961 for attempting to indoctrinate troops and telling them how to vote. Before President Kennedy, General Walker also had friction with Presidents Eisenhower and Truman for the same reasons. In 1962, as a civilian, Walker showed up to lead a protest against James Meredith, the first black student who was enrolled at the University of Mississippi. After a riot broke out during the protest, General Walker was charged with insurrection and sedition. This riot led to two people being killed, six federal marshals being shot, and hundreds of people being injured. Nevertheless, all of the charges against Walker were dismissed on January 22, 1963. Starting in late February of 1963, just a few weeks after beating his insurrection case, General Walker went on a six-week, 29-city bus tour with evangelist preacher Billy Hargis. The purpose of the tour was to alert the American public to the dangers of the civil rights movement and, of course, communism. Walker and Hargis branded their speaking tour Operation Midnight Ride. Thousands of people attended their rallies in each city, including many reporters. It's around this time, at the height of his fame, that someone fires a shot at General Walker. In this episode, we examine the evidence and witness statements related to the General Walker shooting. Did Lee Harvey Oswald fire at General Walker, or did someone else? In Dallas, Texas, three shots were fired at President Kennedy's motorcade in downtown Dallas. The first reports say that President Kennedy has been seriously wounded by this shooting. The flash, apparently official, President Kennedy died at 1 p.m. Central Standard Time. This is Solving JFK. I'm your host, Matt Crumpton. Just two days after General Walker returned from the very successful Operation Midnight Ride speaking tour, he was working on his tax returns at a desk in his study. Suddenly, he heard a loud noise and was almost hit by a single bullet that zipped past him. Here's how General Walker described it. Well, the police from the city came in to investigate a rifle shot that was fired into the house, fired through the west window, and hit the cell and hit the wall across the room and went through the wall over the desk at which I was sitting. Walker then vaguely described who he thought was responsible for firing the shot. Well, there's an enemy within this country, and of course it's the same enemy that uh, represents the position that we should do away with the House on american Activities Committee, that we should destroy our local police forces, and that we should uh, do away with our military forces. These are the, uh, you might say, the anti-Americans as far as our traditions, heritage, and constitution are concerned. And there are plenty of them in this country, in spite of the federal government's position, that there is no uh, <clears throat> threat from within. There is a threat from within, and this uh, is just further indications that uh, there is a threat to our individual rights and liberties. While General Walker was a virulently racist guy who had many views that I do not condone, you have to give it to him that he was consistent with his talking points. Even when he gets shot at, 
he somehow finds a way to immediately pivot to blaming communists. And from that clip, it doesn't sound like General Walker had any idea at all who shot at him. So what do we know when it comes to the details of the shooting? After the single rifle shot was fired, General Walker immediately called the police. Officer Billy Jean Norvell was at the Walker residence within five minutes and removed a badly mutilated bullet from the wall. Officer Norvell then gave the bullet to Detective Don McElroy and his partner Ira Van Cleve. Both Van Cleve and McElroy described the bullet as, quote, unknown caliber steel jacket. Then McElroy and Van Cleve turned the bullet over to Lieutenant J.C. Day of the Dallas Police. Now, back in April of 1963, when the Walker shooting happened, the only evidence that existed on what type of ammo was used is that it was a steel jacketed 30 6 This is the way the bullet was described by detectives McElroy and Van Cleve and the way it was documented in the pages of the New York Times, both Dallas newspapers and the Associated Press. But as we will see, after the assassination of President Kennedy, the focus of the General Walker shooting turns for the first time to Lee Harvey Oswald. On November 30th, 1963, eight days after the assassination, the FBI requested the Walker bullet from the Dallas police. Once the FBI received the bullet, firearms expert Robert Frazier identified it for the first time as copper jacketed, which would be a requirement for it to have possibly come from the Carcano rifle that was found on the sixth floor of the school book depository. Frazier said that it was inconclusive whether or not the Walker bullet came from the Carcano. The Warren Commission also brought in expert Joseph Nickel to give a second opinion. And like Frazier, Nickel was also unable to conclusively link the rifle and the bullet though Nickel did think it was more likely that it came from the Carcano than Frazier did. And it wasn't just Frazier and Nickel who couldn't make the link between the bullet and the rifle. There's a March 27, 1964 FBI memo that describes testing done by FBI agents Henry Heiberger and John Gallagher. That memo says, quote, the lead alloy of the bullet recovered from the attempted shooting of General Walker was different from the lead alloy of a large bullet fragment from the car in which President Kennedy was shot. In other words, this FBI report definitively stated that the bullet used to shoot at General Walker could not be the same as the bullets that were used to shoot at President Kennedy. When General Walker had a chance to visit the National Archives and see the bullet that was supposed to be the one that was fired at him, he told Robert Blakey, the HSCA chief counsel, that it was not the same bullet. He said, quote, The bullet before your select committee called the Walker bullet is not the Walker bullet. It is not the bullet that was fired at me and taken out of my house by the Dallas City Police on April 10th, 1963. On top of that, after examining the Walker bullet, the HSCA photo panel said, quote, It is still questionable whether the Manlicker Carcano can be linked to Oswald, but even if it was his, it could not have fired the Walker bullet. Oswald's alleged rifle fired 6.5 millimeter ammunition, copper jacketed, while the Walker bullet was a steel jacketed 30 6 For about seven months, the General Walker case sat cold with no leads. Then, only after the assassination of President Kennedy, the blame is put on Oswald for the first time. On Saturday, November 23rd, a reporter asked Dallas Police Chief Jesse Curry, quote, Is there any connection yet between this and the firing at Major General Walker? 
We don't know why the reporter thought that there may be a connection or even who the reporter was. On the same day, Michael Payne told the Houston Post, quote, Oswald may have been involved in the Walker affair. Maybe Payne was just speculating about this. We don't know exactly why he said it, but it's the second documented instance of anyone saying that Oswald may have been involved in the General Walker shooting. The next day, Sunday, November 24th, a reporter named Hasso Thorstein made a transatlantic phone call to General Walker. Thorstein worked for a West German newspaper called Deutsche National Zeitung. On the call, he asked General Walker if he thought Oswald may have been the one who shot at him. General Walker was surprised at what was printed when the article was published in the German paper a few days later on November 29th. The article said that Walker knew Oswald was the one who fired at him and that the Dallas police were aware of this fact as well, but didn't do anything to stop Oswald. When General Walker was interviewed by the Warren Commission, he was asked whether he told this German newspaper that he knew Oswald was the one who shot at him. And he responded, quote, No, I did not. I wouldn't have known it. It was much later they began to tie Oswald into me, and I don't even know it yet. Walker added that he did not believe that it was Lee Harvey Oswald who fired the shot. We just talked about evidence that tends to show that the bullet that was fired at General Walker could not have come from the rifle that allegedly belonged to Oswald. So after that exonerating evidence, why is Oswald still accused by so many people of shooting at General Walker? There are three things that the Warren Report ultimately relies on to reach its conclusion that Oswald shot at General Walker. First, a note which Oswald left for his wife on the evening of the shooting. Second, photographs found among Oswald's possession after the assassination of President Kennedy. And third, admissions and other statements made to Marina Oswald by Oswald concerning the shooting. Let's look at each of those three points one at a time. We'll start with the note. On November 30th, 1963, the day after the West German newspaper story, Ruth Payne gave two books to Captain Paul Barger because she wanted to get them to Marina, who Ruth said used these books constantly. Barger gave the books to Detective John Looper, who passed them on to Russian-speaking Secret Service agent Leon Gopadze. When Gopadze opened the books, he found an undated note that was written in Russian. And it is surprising that Gopadze is the first member of law enforcement to see this note in the book because, according to what Ruth Payne told the Warren Commission, the Dallas Police Department, quote, leafed through her books to see if anything fell out. So one would think that if the note was there, it would have been discovered. The note had 11 numbered paragraphs. Most of it deals with administrative information about finances and Oswald's affairs, including the P.O. box, the status of bills, and money that he left for Marina. Other paragraphs make it clear that the purpose of this note is to explain the next steps in case the author is caught. For example, it says, quote, Send the information as to what has happened to me to the embassy and include newspaper clippings should there be anything about me in the newspapers. I believe that the embassy will come quickly to your assistance on learning everything. If I am alive and taken prisoner... The city jail is located at the end of the bridge. On December 2nd, after reading this note, Agent Gopadze called Marina at her business manager Jim Martin's house and asked her about the note. According to the Secret Service report, the note was constructed in very poor Russian and Marina said she didn't know anything about it. 
But on the next day, December 3rd, Marina told the Secret Service during an in-person visit that the note was written by her husband the night before the General Walker shooting. On top of that, Marina says point blank that Lee admitted to her that he shot at General Walker. She said that she didn't tell the police about it because she wanted to keep this note as leverage against Lee so that he wouldn't hit her in the future. When this note is eventually sent to FBI handwriting expert James Cadigan, he concludes that it was written by Lee Harvey Oswald. But if Oswald did write the note, he did so without getting any fingerprints on it. There are seven fingerprints on the note, but none of them belong to Lee or Marina. This begs the question, whose fingerprints are they? According to the Warren Report, three photographs that show the home of General Walker were found among Oswald's possessions in Ruth Payne's garage. Two of these pictures were taken from the exact location where the shooter would have been standing when the shot was fired at General Walker's house. Two pictures of railroad tracks were also found among Oswald's possessions. The Warren Report says that these tracks were located near General Walker's home. These photos of General Walker's house, like the backyard photos, were also linked to the Imperial Reflex camera by the FBI and later confirmed by the HSCA photographic panel. One of the photos shows a 1957 Chevrolet parked in front of General Walker's home. You can see the license plate on the Chevy in the original picture, which was published by Dallas Police Chief Jesse Curry in his 1969 book. But once that photo was in the FBI's possession, they cut out the license plate for this vehicle. As we'll see, the reason that this alteration to the photo is potentially meaningful to the case is that on April 9th, The day before the shot was fired at General Walker, one of Walker's aides, Max Claunch, saw a, quote, Cuban or dark-complected man in a 1957 Chevy who was driving slowly around Walker's house several times. Was this Chevy the same one that was parked in the driveway? Or is that just another coincidence? The last thing that the Warren Commission relied on to blame the General Walker shooting on Lee Harvey Oswald were the words of his wife, Marina. She told FBI agents, the Warren Commission, and her biographer, Priscilla Johnson, that her husband made detailed written plans to shoot at General Walker, and then he actually followed through with it. Marina also says that Lee took the photos of General Walker's home and the nearby railroad tracks using the Imperial Reflex camera. She says that those photos were part of Oswald's overall planning for the assassination of General Walker. And in addition to the pictures, Marina says that Lee had a notebook with detailed written plans for the attack. At Marina's urging, She says that Oswald then destroyed the notebook. But if Oswald was worried about getting caught, he would have also needed to destroy the guilty-sounding note that he allegedly left for Marina and the photos of Walker's house that were found among his possessions. But he didn't do either of those things. Marina also said that she saw Lee with a map and bus routes. When it comes to the rifle, Marina says that Lee told her that he took the rifle with him on a bus to go practice shooting at Love Field. Now, this is almost impossible to believe because Love Field was then, just like today, an airport. Marina then claimed that after the General Walker shooting, Lee buried the rifle in a field near the railroad tracks. Taking what Marina Oswald says at face value, her husband is guilty. 
she says that he flat out admitted it. So if you think there's something going on other than Oswald acting alone, you'll need to have an explanation for these statements from Marina, where she says that she took the backyard photos, that Oswald did possess the guns shown in those photos, and that Oswald confessed to shooting General Walker. But if you have doubts about the veracity of what Marina is saying, you wouldn't be the first. Freda Scobie, a Warren Commission staffer, sent a memo to Commissioner Richard Russell about whether Marina was being truthful. In the memo, Scobie asks whether it makes sense to continue to question Marina given how many things she got wrong or lied about already. Scobie said, quote, Marina directly lied on at least two occasions. Her answers could be a skillful parry of the questions. It does seem to me that if her testimony lacks credibility, there is no reason for sheltering her. The above spots where her veracity was not tested are perfectly obvious to any person reading the report in connection with the transcript, and it might become a policy matter whether this decision to brush her feathers tenderly is well advised. Marina also told the Warren Commission that Oswald attempted to kill Richard Nixon at a time when Nixon was nowhere near Texas. While the commission did accept most of Marina's testimony, they ruled out the part about Oswald trying to kill Nixon. In 1978, the HSCA wrote a 29-page report titled Marina Oswald Porter's Statements of Contradictory Nature. The HSCA concluded that they could not agree with the Warren Commission on Oswald's involvement in the Walker incident simply because of Marina's lack of credibility. The HSCA said, quote, We regretfully refuse to accept the judgment of the commission in regard to the Walker shooting, hoping that its prides and prejudices were a result of error and not expedience. The Warren Report says that on the evening of Saturday, April 13th, Three days after the Walker shooting, George and Jean DeMorenschilt stopped by the Oswald's Neely Street apartment to bring an Easter gift for their daughter, June. Jean DeMorenschilt told the Warren Commission that during this visit, she saw a rifle with a scope on it in the closet. She then told George about it, and he said to Oswald jokingly, did you take a pot shot at Walker by chance? After that, DeMornschilt said that Oswald acted weird and said that he was just using the gun for target shooting. George never actually saw the rifle. He was just relying on what his wife told him. Marina, for her part, contradicts the DeMornschilt story. When asked by the commission if she showed the DeMornschilt's the rifle, she said, quote, I know that DeMorn Schultz had said the rifle had been shown to him, but I don't remember that. She also said that DeMorn Schultz asked if Oswald shot General Walker as soon as he walked in the door, which is not what George and Jean DeMorn Schultz say. Most importantly, Marina told the FBI that Oswald returned home with his rifle under a raincoat on a bus on the Sunday after the Walker shooting, which would be April 14th. But since the DeMoran Schultz visited on Saturday, April 13th, it's not possible that the rifle could have been there according to Marina's own timeline. While we've mentioned a few details so far that seem to potentially incriminate Oswald when it comes to the General Walker shooting, There's also some evidence that makes it seem impossible that Oswald alone could have been the shooter. First, there are reports of strange vehicles at General Walker's house in the days before the shooting. Robert Surrey, an aide to General Walker, told the police that four nights before the shooting, he saw two men wearing suits and ties sitting in a brown or purple 1963 Ford 
behind General Walker's house around 9 o'clock. The men got out of the car and walked around the home looking in the windows. They then saw that someone was watching them, got back in the Ford, and took off. Surrey followed the vehicle to downtown Dallas, but he lost track of it. The Ford had no license plate, and Surrey said that neither man looked like Oswald. Then, one day before the shooting, on April 9th, another one of Walker's aides, Max Clonch, saw a, quote, Cuban or dark-complected man in a 1957 Chevy who was driving slowly around Walker's house several times. What's even more suspicious about this vehicle, as we mentioned before, is that a similar vehicle is pictured in front of General Walker's house in one of the photos that Oswald allegedly took. But in that picture, the license plate was later cut out by the FBI. Who knows? Maybe this is just another one of those weird coincidences, but it's certainly worth noting. Next, there's the testimony from 15-year-old Walter Coleman, who lived next door to the church and very close to the open field where the shots came from. After Coleman heard what he thought was a car backfire, He stepped up on a bike so he could look over the fence where he was able to see clearly because of the floodlight at the church. Coleman said he then saw two men get into a beige 1950s Ford. One man he described as being 19 or 20 years old, white, 5'10", with dark bushy hair, and a large nose. The other man Coleman didn't see as clearly but he said he was about six foot one and 200 pounds. Coleman said that he had seen photos of Lee Harvey Oswald and neither of the men he saw resembled Oswald. The testimony of Walter Coleman is consistent with the initial findings of the FBI and the Dallas police that there were two men who were seen fleeing from the Walker shooting. Walter Coleman's story is somewhat supported by Scott Hansen, who was attending a Boy Scout meeting at the church behind General Walker's house on the night of the shooting. He told the FBI that he saw a black and white 1958 Chevy next to the fence that separated the church parking lot from General Walker's house. Hansen said that he saw the same car parked in the same place on a previous Wednesday, but he never saw that car again after the night of the shooting. In addition to the statements we just heard, housekeepers in the home across the street from General Walker also claimed that they saw a suspicious man on the night of the shooting. Ruby and Edgar Boggs worked for the homeowner Samuel Gilbert as live-in housekeepers. They told their daughter that after the shooting, they saw a man running through the alley behind General Walker's house. Her parents weren't sure, but they think the man ran into Gilbert's driveway and possibly hid in the basement. Now, this story doesn't exactly match up with what Walter Coleman said, which is that there were two men in the vehicle who then departed immediately after the shots were fired. This would mean that the Boggs were either mistaken about what they saw, or if they are correct and Coleman is correct, it would mean that there could have been a third person. But why would that person hide across the street when the other two people took a car? It's hard to make sense of the Boggs story, as relayed by their daughter, Shirley. While the Boggs' revelations regarding the night of the Walker shooting don't seem to fit neatly with the other evidence, it's worth noting that Samuel Gilbert was a close associate of none other than Jack Ruby, who, of course, would go on to murder Oswald. The Boggs, through their daughter Shirley, who was an adult at the time and remembers these interactions, 
say that from 1960 to 1963, Jack Ruby visited the Gilbert home for dinner on numerous occasions. It turns out that Samuel Gilbert and Jack Ruby went way back. Their families both emigrated from Poland to New York, and then they left New York together to move to Chicago. After that, Jack and Samuel both moved to Dallas. The Boggs also told their daughter that Gilbert frequently visited a friend in New Orleans named Ferry. As we'll soon discuss, David Ferry was a mysterious man with many connections in the JFK assassination. If Gilbert really knew David Ferry and went to visit him often, that is potentially a very relevant link. When Gilbert found out that Ruby had shot Oswald, the Boggs say that he almost passed out. And to further complicate the story, Samuel Gilbert died a few months after the assassination in February of 1964, supposedly after cutting his own wrist. Gilbert's funeral had a closed casket and was attended by only six people. Mrs. Boggs believed that Gilbert had faked his own death and perhaps moved to Israel because she had seen an Israeli passport before. Aside from Coleman, Hansen, and the Boggs, another reason to doubt Oswald's sole guilt in the Walker shooting is that Walker actually hired a private investigator. According to Walker, the investigation revealed that brothers Larry and Bobby Schmidt, local right-wing activists, may have connected with Oswald and may have been responsible for the shooting. Oswald, as we know, was outwardly a left-wing Marxist. So if the results of Walker's investigation are accurate, that would put the Marxist Oswald hanging out with and plotting with the right-wing Schmidt brothers, which raises the question, what is going on here? Another potential reason that Oswald alone could not have shot at General Walker is that Oswald may have had an alibi in the form of dinner with Marina, Ruth, and Michael Payne. Remember, the Walker shooting is on April 10th. Michael Payne told the Warren Commission that he picked up the Oswalds at their Neely Street house for dinner with the Paynes in Irving on April 10th. Payne didn't even correct the date himself. He relied on commission counsel Wesley Liebler to do that. Liebler interjected later in Michael Payne's testimony saying, quote, for the benefit of the commission, the record indicates it was about April 2nd, 1963 that Michael Payne picked up the Oswalds for dinner. Ruth Payne said that the dinner was on April 2nd and she knew because she had a calendar. And when we look at Ruth Payne's calendar for 1963, it does have a notation on April 2nd for this dinner. But on April 10th of that same calendar, the word Marina is written in Russian with an arrow pointing from April 10th to April 11th. The Warren Commission never asked Ruth Payne about the meaning of this April 10th Marina notation. Finally, if Marina's story of Oswald burying a rifle in the dirt in a field is accurate, we would expect to find some evidence of that. But when the FBI microscopically examined the rifle, there were no traces of soil which on top of him not having any tools for digging, makes it very unlikely that Lee buried a rifle under the dirt. Looking at all of the evidence together, the arguments that Oswald acted alone to shoot General Walker are that his wife says that he confessed, there were photos in his possession of General Walker's house, and there's an incriminating note that Oswald supposedly left for Marina 
which the FBI expert said was in Oswald's handwriting. If these things are true, this is extremely persuasive evidence that Oswald shot at General Walker. Still, upon further examination, Marina's testimony is all over the place and is not reliable, as noted by both the Warren Commission and the HSCA. And the circumstances of finding this note are suspicious since the police were supposed to have already leafed through the books that were in the house. I understand how someone could say that Oswald probably did shoot at General Walker because of Marina's testimony and because of the FBI expert confirmation of Oswald's handwriting on the note. I get it. Nevertheless, just like the HSCA, I believe that it's impossible that the bullet fired at General Walker came from the Manlicker Carcano that Oswald allegedly owned. The original story of the 30 6 steel jacket bullet, plus the FBI Heiberger and Gallagher memo, makes it absolutely conclusive that the alleged Oswald Carcano did not fire the shot at General Walker. Also, the only eyewitness who spoke to authorities at the time says that there were two men who fled the scene in a car. And we also have the testimony of Robert Surrey that someone in a car was casing out General Walker's house days earlier. This leaves us with two potential scenarios. One is that Oswald was involved in firing a shot at General Walker, but he did it with the help of at least one other person including using that person's rifle and getaway vehicle. That would potentially explain the note and the photos, but would raise new questions about who Oswald was working with. This scenario does not rule out Oswald being involved because he was told to do it, for example, as part of an intelligence assignment. The other potential scenario is that Oswald was a pure patsy in the General Walker shooting. If so, the shooting was done by two other people using a different rifle and leaving in a vehicle. If that is the case, then someone would have had to affirmatively frame Oswald with the note and the photos and Marina and Jean de Morenschild would both have to be lying. Next time on Solving JFK, we'll be joined by director Max Good. Max was the creative force behind the 2022 film The Assassination and Mrs. Payne. The film looks at the role of Ruth Payne as it relates to her experience with the Oswalds. It's a great documentary, and if you haven't seen it, I highly recommend that you check it out. After we speak with Max, we'll resume following the activities of Lee Harvey Oswald about seven months before the assassination as he moves from Dallas to New Orleans. If you heard anything that you believe is out of context, or if you have additional information to offer, you can let us know at solvingjfkpodcast at gmail.com. Please provide citations to the record for any fact that you're relying on. For transcripts, sources, and official podcast merchandise, visit solvingjfkpodcast.com. In Dallas, Texas, three shots were fired at President Kennedy's motorcade in downtown Dallas. The flash, apparently official, President Kennedy died at 1 p.m. Central Standard Time. Thanks for listening. Visit SolvingJFKPodcast.com for more information. I'm just, I'm just, I'm just, I'm just.